All right, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ruth. Uh, so the passage today is not going to come up here for a little while. But uh, So this past week we journeyed through the book of, of Ruth, and so it's a fitting time, I think, that we are in this gospel. So, An orphaned boy was living with his grandmother when their house caught fire. The grandmother trying to get upstairs to res- tried to get upstairs to rescue the boy, but in doing so, she perished in the flames. The boy's cry for help were finally answered by a man who climbed an iron drain pipe and came back down with the boy hanging tightly to his neck. Several weeks later, a public hearing was held to determine who would receive custody of the boy. A farmer, a teacher, and the town's wealthiest citizen all gave reasons they felt they should be chosen to give the boy a home. But as they talked, the lad's eyes remained focused on the floor. Then a stranger walked to the front and slowly took his hands out of his pocket, revealing severe scars on them. As the crowd gasped, the boy cried out in recognition. This was the man who had saved his life. His hands had been burned when he climbed up the hot pipe. With a leap, the boy threw his arms around the man's neck and held on for dear life. The other men silently walked away, leaving the boy and his rescuer alone. Those marred hands had settled the issue. That man had paid for the price of redemption. Palm Sunday is a celebration for honoring Jesus' victorious entry into Jerusalem. While this was a joyful and a special occasion for his followers, this event took place towards the end of his days on earth, as we well know, shortly before he was to be crucified. Now you saw the kids walking forward this morning with palm branches, and those palm branches signify victory and triumph, peace, and eternal life, originating all the way back into the Near East and Mediterranean world, towards the beginning of creation. Now as Jesus rode in on the back of his donkey, The crowd laid their cloaks and their palm branches on the ground, and they proclaimed, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Hosanna is often translated as save us. He came to save us from our sin and shame, to take us from a place of hopelessness to a place of hope. He offers to be our Redeemer. And so with that statement in mind, it is very fitting that we find ourselves in the book of Ruth this week. My sermon in a sentence this week is this, and so for those of you, if you are new and haven't heard this before, this is intended to be my summary statement for the message. So that when you leave this place and you go back to your homes or to your places of work or wherever it may be, And someone asks you, you know, what was it that was talked about in your church? Or if the door is open for you to be able to share, what was it that you talked about this Palm Sunday? This is a good place maybe to go back to. And it's this, that Jesus came to die for us to take away the shame and guilt from our sins. And to offer us the opportunity to be Redeemed. Now, before we get into the book of Ruth, let's actually go back a couple chapters or a couple of books, excuse me, to the book of Leviticus. And we're going to find ourselves in Leviticus 25. Again, you can follow along in your Bible, but we'll be flipping around a little bit, so the passages will also be up on the screen. So, Leviticus 25, starting in verse 23. We read, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, because the land is mine. This is God talking. 
for you are only strangers and residents with me. So for every piece of your property, you are to provide for the redemption of the land. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor that he sells part of his property, then his closest redeemer is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Or in case someone has no redeemer, but recovers to find sufficient means for its redemption, then he shall calculate the years since its sale and refund the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and so return to his property. But if he has not found sufficient means to get back for himself, then what he has sold shall remain in the hands of its purchaser until the year of the jubilee. But at the jubilee, so that he may return, sorry, but at the jubilee it shall revert, so that it may return to his, to his property. Now God had established a law that this kinsman redeemer, this individual who would redeem the land in this circumstance, should be a, or must be a relative. Now, here's an example of how this passage I just read might have played itself out in that day. So this is not from Scripture. This is my story, but I think it fits pretty well with what's being said. There was a man who could not get his little farm to pay his bills. Now, he may have been a poor manager, or maybe the fields were not of good quality, or maybe the weather was against him. But whatever the reason may be, he had to sell his land in order to pay his debts. Now, after selling the land, he could not get it back without doing one of these three things. Either first, he could uh, pay off the debt. So if he somehow later on came across the financial wherewithal to pay it off, he could do that. Another option would be he could wait for this year of Jubilee, this 50-year cycle where the land would revert back to the people that previously owned the land, the original landowners. But if they didn't want to wait that long, if there was someone in that line, you could have what they called a kinsman redeemer. So it was getting a kin, a family member, to purchase and redeem that land back. Now, let's skip down a little bit in that same chapter, chapter 25, verses 47 through 49. Now, if the means of a stranger or of a foreign resident with you becomes sufficient and a countryman of yours becomes poor in relation to him and sells himself to the stranger who is residing with you or to the descendants of the stranger's family, Then he shall have redemption right after he has been sold. One of his brothers may redeem it, or his uncle, or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or one of his blood relatives from his family may redeem him. Or if he prospers, he may redeem it himself. Now what I just read there maybe is a little confusing, but here's another kind of a a laying out of what this may have looked like. In this passage here, this is an even sadder situation because this man who maybe lost his property due to crop failure or famine, he was reduced to extreme poverty. He had debts to pay and no money to pay them with. What we learn or what we kind of read through this is he must have already sold his property. The land is gone. He doesn't have that even to use to sell off. How do we know that? Because as a last resort, we read that he sells himself into slavery to pay his debt. If no other relative would do so, then in the year of Jubilee, uh, I'm sorry, he must somehow earn the money. Sorry, I lost my spot there. Sorry. In order to get free, he must either earn the money while he's working He must wait for that year of Jubilee to come around, or he needed a kinsman redeemer to come redeem him. God wanted his people to keep their land and not to sell it outside their family. And so thus he created this law that 
if they must sell it, if they must sell the land to pay the debt, there was this option for a relative to, to buy the land back, to pay the debt for them. And again, if no relative was able or willing, and they were not able to come up with the land, God had that jubilee in place so that that land could then be returned. And all of the slaves this man in this situation would have been set free. So now let's turn to the book of Ruth with my first, my first point, and it's that Ruth and Naomi needed a kinsman redeemer to restore their situation to God's original design of the land given to them. Now the story of Ruth is really about a kinsman redeemer. And if that's a new term to you, You'll hear that fleshed out a little bit more as this sermon goes along. But at the beginning of the book, we read Elimelech, Ruth's father-in-law, sold his property. We know that because they move on to Moab. However, not too long after they move, we realize or learn that he and both of his sons die. Now, Naomi decides that it is time for her to return home. There's nothing left there for her. And so she tells her two daughter-in-laws that they are free to return home, that they should go back and marry again to people in their own communities, that there's really nothing left that she has in her mind to offer the two women. Now, at this point in time, Ruth delivers the line that if I asked you all to pick one line out of Ruth, this would probably be the line that 99% of you would say. She says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. So Ruth and Naomi, we read, return to Bethlehem. The problem is, is that when they return, they don't have a kinsman redeemer right there. They've been out of the area for a while. And so they have to figure out where they're going to live. Now, she doesn't have any, apparently, money to uh, repurchase the land. So it appears at the surface that she's going to have to wait for the year of Jubilee to get her land back. But as I've already said, this kinsman redeemer was her third option. Now let's talk about this kinsman redeemer for just a minute. This was a man who had to be benevolent. Because being a, king, uh, a uh, kinsman redeemer was costly. Because the poor relative could never possibly repay that redeemer. In some cases, the amount that was paid by the kinsman redeemer must have been a tremendous sum. Therefore, he had to have great wealth. Let's put it into maybe common day terms for just a second. Let's say that you own a home, and you're paying on it, and because of some hardships you faced, you realize that you've got no hope to be able to make your next payment. Or maybe... You know, being able to just think, what's going to happen? You lose your job and things, you know, there's medical conditions and all sorts of things. And someone steps in and says, I want to help you out. I want to redeem this property. Or maybe you've lost your home and someone, someone that, you know, they come to you and they say, you know what, we want to redeem your property for you. You don't deserve this, but we're going to do this for you. We're going to pay back what you don't rightfully deserve. So there was no way that that was going to be repaid. So being a kinsman redeemer was a great act of mercy. If, if they didn't have a kind and generous heart, there was really no reason for them to go out of their way to help their poor relative. They could have just said, well, if they would have just managed their money better, or if life just hadn't treated them the way that it has, let them figure it out.
this kinsman redeemer had to be motivated by a love for this relative. Why else would he or someone pay such a great price from his own pocket to redeem the land for someone else or to free someone from slavery? Something that directly they wouldn't benefit from at all. Now in the story of Ruth, Boaz becomes that kinsman redeemer. Evidently, as I said, Elimelech had been, must have become so poor that he was forced to sell his land prior to them moving to Moab. Or maybe they were fearing there was a famine coming and so he decided to get out before that hit. Now over ten years had passed since that sale and he had died and so had his sons and so that left Naomi and Ruth. So Naomi, as they return to Bethlehem, hatches a plan. She sends Ruth to Boaz in chapter 3 in order to redeem him, or re redeem her, excuse me. Boaz tells her that there is a redeemer. In fact, there's one more closely uh, aligned or related to her. So this is saying Boaz was in line, but he wasn't the first in line. There was another person who had more of a right. We learn that in the last words of verse, the last verse in chapter 3. That Boaz immediately goes to resolve the situation. So understand what's going on here. She comes to him to have him redeem their land, to redeem her. And he could have said, yeah, I'll do it. But he pauses and he says, no, we need to do this in the right way. There's someone else here that has the first right, as we might say, the first right of refusal. Now, Boaz's expediency, again, let me clarify that just to make sure that last sentence that I said made sense. He immediately finds out about Ruth and then heads that way. Naomi says, by the end of this day, before the sun goes down, he'll get this resolved one way or another. So his expediency is noteworthy here because there was nobody externally pressuring him to go do this. No one else was about to marry Ruth. And he's not under a legal requirement to do it. He doesn't have to do it. He could just say, you know what, I'm going to marry her or I'm just, I'm going to ignore her request. She was just a poor widow and had little value to most people. So why was he in such a rush? Now presumably, the text doesn't say this, but presumably it's because in, uh, in some ways he is attracted to Ruth. He finds her um, appealing. Uh, he sees a positive, uh, positive traits characteristics in her but also that he is a man of his word. He will do what he said, and he's going to do it without delay. But at the same time, he's not willing to cut corners. Okay, it would have been real quick for him to say, you know what, let's, I'll redeem you, let's deal with it. But he says, no, I'm a man of my word, I'm a man of integrity, we're going to do this the right way. So although he wants to marry Ruth, he first finds the man who is, in fact, a closer relative. He has the first right to the land and to Ruth's hand in marriage. Now, once, upon finding the man, he convenes a quorum of the town elders, and court is now in session. So we pick up today, now finally, in chapter 4, at the beginning here. This is, so they're in this meeting with the elders, and here is... What unfolds? We read, Boaz went to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, Come over here, friend. Sit down here. And he came over and sat down. 
Then he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the land of Moab, has to sell the plot of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought that I would inform you, saying that buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one except you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. In, Ruth, in, in, Ruth, in verse 3 there, we said that Naomi, Naomi says there that she was selling a parcel of land. But interestingly enough, later in the text, Boaz and his kinsmen don't ever discuss buying the land. In fact, it says they discussed redeeming the land. Now that may seem like, maybe you think that's the same thing, but it's not. Her offer there is a plea to the kinsmen to redeem the land for her. This land was not in her possession. It was not that she was selling land so that she could, could pay off her debts. It was that they, she wanted this whole land and herself redeemed. Now, initially, as I said, the man said, yep, I'll redeem it. But then, Boaz adds this, starting in verse 5. He said, on that day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased of his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Otherwise, I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have the right of redemption since I cannot redeem it. Now, just a quick side note. The idea behind this was that the next Redeemer, the one first in line, would marry and then they would have kids. But the kids would carry on the legacy of the man that had died. So as a way to carry on the family name. But it's interesting because initially the man is interested. Boaz brings Ruth into the picture and it changes things. Now we don't know exactly what the reason was, why it changed his thought process. There could be a number of things. But we read that the kinsman redeemer must marry the widow. So he was clearly unable or unwilling to do that. So he passes his right to Boaz. In front of the elders, he says, I'm giving up my right. It is now yours. Boaz recognized this, and he had to be willing, if he was going to take his place and, take the, and do what, he, uh, what was his now position, he also had to be okay with marrying Ruth if he wanted to redeem the land. But it appears as we read that his redemption was not just solely for the pity of these two widows. In the weeks that passed before he redeemed Ruth, God had nurtured a love in his heart for Ruth. One scholar wrote this about the book of Ruth. He said, the book of Ruth reveals the love side of redemption. Now to be intellectually honest here. Let's take a minute and deal with the thing that maybe is sitting in your minds here. Something that's maybe difficult to read in this, and that's this idea that of a woman being traded as like a piece of property. as what's playing here. This is a difficult thing to kind of work through, and so I want to just I want to try to give you some other perspective on what's going on here. So one thing we need to acknowledge is the difference in culture, but I think there's something else also at work. We need to realize that this system that God instilled was put in place not for the intent purpose of treating a woman as property, but to provide for their care and well-being, to help give them permanent security. Remember where they are coming out of, what they are in the midst of, 
And this was put in place to give them an opportunity to reclaim their land and their hope for the future. So instead of primarily reading this as the, this is property, no, he's, he is treating them, he's attempting to treat them as family, as valued family. And so in this way, the law was put in place so that widows and children would not fall destitute or into destitute poverty. Secondly, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer who alone provides a path to be reconciled to God. Now I hope in just some of the language, I haven't even directly addressed it, but I hope as you're hearing the language of kinsman redeemer, redeeming something that you don't deserve when you are broken, hopefully the obvious parallels pop right out to who Jesus was. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, we read that Christ calls us his brothers. We were poor, miserable creatures serving as slaves to sin. But he, being our creator and our relative, has the right to be our spiritual kinsman redeemer. Jesus alone could pay our sin debt for us. We were poor, helpless sinners enslaved to sin. Each one of us in this room unable to redeem ourselves. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you work, or what you don't say or don't do, can redeem you. That sin debt resides over every person on the face of the earth, unless... They've allowed Jesus to pay it for them. In Ephesians chapter 1, we know that he paid for this sin, this debt, through his blood. He said in verse one, chapter 1, verse 7, In whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of his sins according to the riches of his graces. He redeems us from all sin. In Titus chapter 2, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity? And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. His redemption is what fully justifies us, freeing us from guilt. And finally, in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. When Christ died for us, he paid the ultimate price for our souls. But he didn't stop there. He loves us so much that what we read in the text is he made us his bride. His instructions in Ephesians 5 are to a husband on loving his wife. And they are based on Christ's love for us as his bride, the church. Charles Wesley once penned these words. And they're probably familiar, maybe even more familiar to some of you than they were to me when I came across them. But it was, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me. Jesus Christ was qualified. He's the only qualified one to redeem you. And not only that, he was happy to redeem you, even though it cost him dearly. In love, he has redeemed us to become like his bride. That's Amazing love. And so we are reminded that Jesus came, as we think about this holy week that is upon us, we are reminded that Jesus came to die for us, to take away the shame and the guilt from our sins. And he offers us the opportunity to be redeemed. If you don't know that redemption, and I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. If you don't know the redemption found in Jesus, 
Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we exalt you for who you are and for your willingness to send your Son, your own flesh and blood, to die for us. Lord, we, we don't deserve any of it. And we acknowledge the, that we are all guilty in your sight, that we are ashamed of the things we have done. And sometimes those characteristics or those feelings that we can express <coughs> dominate our lives. They control who we are and what we're willing and able to do. Lord, we live sometimes in this fear of who we have been, unwilling as, as though stuck in mud to move in a direction for you. Because we think we're we are not called. We're not good enough. If We have just done too much, Lord. And yet we know from your word that when you redeem us, you free us from those things. So, Lord, when we feel those expressions, those uh, feelings of guilt and shame, Lord, I pray that you would remove those things from our hearts. Lord, help us to uh, remind ourselves that we are your children those who love and acknowledge your Son as Lord and Savior in their life. Lord, give us the courage and the boldness this week to live into that freedom that you have given us. Lord, help us this week to be reminded of the glorious deeds of the cross. Lord, as we prepare to consider each of the aspects, the days of, of the week with the cross between the Last Supper and, uh, and you being handed over by Judas and all of the thoughts and emotions that were going through the minds of your disciples. Lord, all of the lessons that they still had to learn in those couple of days. Lord, but then to be able to wake up on that glorious Easter morning to acknowledge and celebrate and to say to one another, He is risen. Lord, teach us to live into that reality. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. May God, whose arms are stretched across the cross to embrace the whole world, help you this week to take up your cross and to follow him. Remember, church, this week and every week when you leave this place, you are sent to do your work for the kingdom. Amen.